To President Klaus, I immediately put the post in social media and I said, I think I should only applaud because I agreed with absolutely everything I think, I think he said. But what an honor. And you're going to think that uh, I read his speech because what I'm going to say complements what he said. Uh, I yielded to what I call the Covidian cult. And the only reason I yielded to Covidian cult is to be here with you, to honor the, the Polish society. God gave me great health, so I never took tests, I seldom take vaccine. But what a privilege is to be with you. And thank you, you know, Rector Stich, President uh, Huasnitsky, uh, and everyone who made this thing uh, uh, possible. Now, I value each and every of your efforts. Yeah. I chose a topic, uh, it's called the Intermarium College, a place for scholars to address economics grounded on the truth about the human person. And I know that most of you are, are lawyers, but I welcome that the trust comes from you, legal experts. When you look at the index of economic freedom, as the one elaborated by Fraser Institute, one of the group I'm, uh, I'm director, you see that the weakening of economic freedom is through the weakening of, of the rule of law. Two thirds of the world doesn't have rule of law as measured by world justice project or transparency. So you cannot prepare, <laughs> pretend that we live in a world of perfect freedom. So we wish you luck. Uh, on all this endeavor. And just, you know, let you know, my life has been, especially the last 30, 40 years, I spent my life with two types of friends. One of them uh, is the pro free market economist. You know, they argue you know, we liberate the economy, all the problems will disappear, including, including family problems. But then it's the other, the values and, and religion side, you know, which they say, well, just just pray, build good families, and all the problems will disappear, even the economic problem. Well, as an economist and a person who tries to give, live a good family life, I think we need both good economics and good families. Uh, President Klaus is on this camp. He's a well-trained economist, but already in 1998, in a speech called Society and the Crisis of Liberalism, he stated that the family, already under attack, he saw it there, he said, remains the main foundation of our society and our public life. But independently of how much I value the family and other social institutions like the church, I'm here today to speak about economics. Since the writings of the early Greeks and the Romans, who reflected on economics like Xenophon or Cicero, to at least the great late scholastics, the main questions that everyone who wrote about economics and social science was, what is good, what is just? But also, let's not forget that Adam Smith, he focused on wealth. I carry Adam Smith in my flag. But he was a moral philosopher. Now, I have written a book that translated here in Poland by, by Pafere, where I show that except for their position on interest rates, the great moralists, the great Catholic moralists, were the true founders of economic science. They were, by the way, the great champions of human rights. Francisco de Vitoria and all his school, uh, famous for international law and human rights. But they also were great champions of economic freedom, private property, and freedom to trade. After that period, uh, political economic questions started to shift, you know, uh, from what is just, what is good, to what benefits the prince or the rulers of a nation? And finally, after Adam Smith, the question began, well, what is more efficient, what creates more wealth? But agreeing with President Klaus, <laughs> if you read The Economist or other newspapers from the establishment today, it seems that the dominant question today is, how can we make everyone obey Brussels, the international financial organizations, and be a willing player in the great reset of the World Economic Forum. Now, the previous question about what is good, what is just, or what rights makes a nation big, are still important. And you see it, the great debates about inequality, you know, and putting America first, 
or, 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 Pol or Poland first. They are important. But uh, sometimes we confuse economic science with political economy. When we speak about economics, you know, as a science, we focus on what is not normative. It studies, for example, if I print more money, what will the effect be on prices or interest rates? It does not ask if it is good or bad to print money, which is a moral question. You know? And science by itself does not determine the actions of those who conduct economic policy. By the way, a poll, Copernicus, was one of the first to warn about the dangers of printing a lot of money. Um, e economic ministers and politicians are free to try different economic policies, but they are not free to create economic science and defy the laws of economics. Uh, they are not free to create the results. I see economic laws, economic science, as part of the natural order. Stabilizing all prices, planning the entire economy, something that most communists abandon, is like trying to stabilize uh, the seas and avoid waves. It can't be done. But you can, however, like in seaport, create protected areas that you think, you think they are important and avoid the waves in some, in some areas. I'm still in favor of maximizing economic freedom, respecting the property rights of all economic actors, the non-criminal economic actors, all those who play by the rules. But through my years studying and working with economics from around the globe, I was able to see a huge variety of level of government intervention in countries that are regarded as the freest in the world with different mixtures of private, public sector interactions, many civil societies have been able to eliminate or radically reduce extreme poverty. But it's not up to me, it's up to you to decide what right mixture should be. I just leave you with a message from what I learned over decades of studying economics. Without a high degree of respect for private property, which requires a framework of monetary stability, freedom to trade, and low regulatory barriers to start and engage in business, I think it will be impossible to protect the cultural values that we share. When we started Acton Institute in 1990, we saw a huge void in the area of economics, and few people were recognizing the valuable role of the entrepreneur. But no, they didn't realize the creative potential of the human person and that you have to respect the right of free initiative. But soon after we created the think tank, Pope John the Paul II releases this outstanding encyclica and his pontificate was seen by us, economists who try to live a Christian life as a breath of fresh air. During his pontificate, Acton was able to organize events and publications at the Vatican. One of those efforts was a conference on Centesimo Sanos and was published by the Vatican in a book in 1998. Uh, in that book, the founder of Acton Institute, Father Robert Sirico, wrote, a clear understanding of what is bent by a market economy is rarely grasped in all its dimensions, even by economic actors and economists. The market, even while possessing practical virtues, remains essentially morally neutral, and thus in need of a broader moral framework in which to operate in a manner that could be considered ethical. And I underline his next sentence. Says, it would be a great mistake to think of the market as possessing an ethic in itself. To do this would be to run the risk of falling into the error the Holy Father warns against when he speaks in Centesimus Sanos of a radical capitalist ideology. He continues in that conference and explained, during certain periods the church has been driven to strong criticism of what was construed to be the liberal society, partly because some in the church, along some liberal economists, old and new, conflated the theories of economic liberalism with moral libertinism, viewing them as one and the same and as mutually reinforcing. It seems to me today that today in both sides, the libertarian and the church, we find people with the same attitude. There are some libertarians who believe economic freedom will show us what we should do. And that each, also, that each human person should be able to define reality, even the reality about themselves. 
but many in the church who in reaction, I think, push with a naive optimism for a new third way based on economic interventionism mandated by bureaucrats and their favorite experts. Uh, having been born in Argentina and living my first three decades of my life there, you have to understand my negative views of economic interventionism. Argentina was one of the richest countries in the world until, until the economic order began to be ruled by interventionism, economic policies pushed by the champions of a badly conceived social justice, which in my native country is usually labeled Peronism after the leader who implemented most of these reforms. A policy that turned a country of European immigrants into a land where the most productive are thinking how best to leave. The best in my native country are asking, how can I leave the country? My confidence in the importance of economic freedom has not waned, although well-intentioned critics argue that we live in a world of economic liberalism. Since we keep measurements, we never, we never had such high level of taxation in relation to the gross national product than today, as measured in the OECD. That's a group of almost the top 40 countries. Never we had such high taxation. Government spending is exploding and monetary intervention is so little restrained. Many of the failures I think you see today are not failures of economic liberalism, but of neostatism. State and quasi-state actors are omnipresent, omnipresent in central banking, in energy, 80%, communications with the Chinese and big oligopolies, and countless areas. But I understand, like many in the audience, that most of the attacks on freedom today don't, don't come from my discipline, from economics. Free speech in today's media, academic, and corporate worlds is under attack. No, it's the so-called cancel culture. But no one gets canceled in university for being in favor of more or less money printing, promoter higher taxes or lower taxes, or different ideas about free or managed trade. But if you start speaking about proven values, you know, like that lead to successful and flourishing lives, like traditional marriage, like freedom of association, like respecting the sacredness of human life in, in the womb, or, or express concern for illegal immigration, then you run the, list, the risk of losing your academic or corporate job. In our case, think tanks who depend on donations, uh, we run the risk of losing, losing donors. You get canceled by speaking about values, not by speaking in favor of economic freedom. Many talented social scientists are afraid and do not have the courage to study the economic and social implications of living according to different values, Christian values. One of the best scholars on the family, Pat Fagan, correctly points out that in addition to the fear of being canceled in influential academic circles, others who experience you know, a divorce or played some role in the killing of life in the womb avoid studying these topics for, for personal uh, reasons, perhaps for, for fearing of being confronted with the pain that they have caused others and perhaps themselves. At Acton Institute, we try to give a voice and disseminate the works of scholars such as Brad Wilcox at the University of Virginia, who are superb social scientists and do not neglect these important topics. I think you know, we need many more like him, and most of you are such scholars. Um, I will send information, June 23, 24, Acton is not a university, but we have a program called Acton University over several days. Uh, we usually have people from more than 80 countries. Last year we had almost 3,000 people attend some of those programs. I should be able to get you scholarships because I think we are an ideal partner of you. But let me conclude now. You know, um, with a, I want to call your college to be a house for these courageous academics who will be part and lead a new scholastic movement that without neglecting the truth about economics will not be afraid to analyze life, family, religion, but with the utmost detail and respect for the new scientific discoveries and the truth about the human person and human freedom. It is my hope that this Intermarion College, which you are starting, will continue to attract and nurture such scholars. You confronted the Swedish invasions. You resisted the totalitarianism of the Nazis and the Russians. 
Now you have the difficult topic of confronting the totalitarianism of the politically correct. You can do it. Roll on. Thank you.